All right, welcome everybody to our webinar session today, which we dedicate to the latest news in the field of fetal cardiac MRI using uh, imaging using MRI. A short note that this webinar will be recorded. It is myself, Heide Bird, and Fabian Cording that will lead you today through this session. And um, this session today is a kickoff session as an introduction into the series for 2024. There will be four sessions following this year, one session at the end of each quarter. So we will have a spring session in March, we will have a summer session in June, and we will have an autumn session in September, and we will have a winter session in December. Let me just quickly give you an overview of the status of fetal CMR around the whole world today. So you can see here uh, the green marks on the maps. Uh, each, um, each, map refer, uh, each mark refers to a site doing fetal CMR by using Doppler ultrasound gating. And in total, so far, we have 59 SmartSync devices in the market. And here you can see the development over time of clinical versus research application. And here each color represents one quarter since uh, 2022 Q4. And while the hospitals that perform research only, they, they stay pretty, pretty much constant over time, the clinical only and the clinical uh, research application, it's constantly increasing. And when we take a quick look into the literature, we can see an increase in peer-reviewed articles, especially in the year of 2023, uh, which is great. And here I would like to highlight the publication from Angela Desmond from the UCLA, where the authors uh, propose a clinical pathway and indications for prenatal imaging in congenital heart disease. And this is nicely shown here in the figure by um, including fetal cardiac MRI in um, uh, in case of an unclear prenatal diagnostic by fetal echocardiogram. So we know that fetal CMR in CHDs is and will be a complementary imaging modality. And this is our motivation to be here today again uh, with the aim to build a community and to offer a platform for networking and for exchange. The format today is similar than the last formats of our webinar session. So each participant, you can talk and you can discuss. Um, please raise your finger to show us that you want to speak. And you can also paste your questions directly into the chat. Um, and one important note as well, as our agenda today is very tight. Um, and we want to mention that in case we need more time for discussion, we have the possibility to add a few minutes after the official end, if that is desired, and just let us know. And now let's uh, turn to our five incredible experts today here. Um, I'd like to first welcome Malenka Bissell from Leeds University that uh, will give a summary from the first fetal CMR workshop. And Malenka, great that you are here and I will directly hand over to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start trying to share my screen. We've been having some issues, but hopefully um, we'll have luck in this now. Um, so um, I've had the opportunity to um, give the first uh, fetal CMR workshop here in England, uh, which was very exciting. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, I yes, can. Yeah. Can. Perfect. Um, and so that took part in uh, June last year. Um, and Haida asked me to kind of give a quick rundown on um, what we've gotten up to um, and where we are. Um, I think we've we found more questions than answers. But there we go. Um, so those of you that uh, know my uh, 40 flow MRI workshops know that um, they're always a lot of fun um, and there's always a theme to it um, just to get all the participants to talk is about um, an internet workshop with only 32 people attending and so this year the theme was Jane Austen and Bridgerton um, so um, there was an ongoing discussion on who was Lady Whistlewind um, and everybody had to talk to each other to find out who may be the culprit, um, which really helped with everybody to engage and meet new people. Um, it's also an amazing venue and we were really lucky with the weather. 
And so we normally have day one as a more technical and then day two as a more clinical day to bring both the technical and clinical aspects together. Um, the It's quite a light um, uh, pro uh, program so that there's loads of room for discussion um, and there are quite long breaks in between so we can all network problem solve, mystery solve as well, um, and build collaboration. And very important, there's lots and lots of nice food. So uh, we started off with talking about our dreams and the kind of three key dreams that we came up with was um, that ideally we want a motion corrected 3D data set that does both Sunny and Flow. Uh, we definitely want multi bank motion corrected 4D flow so we can do both um, and very fast AI reconstruction of everything including fetal volume. Um, we also talked about our wish list um, and, the two, and the things that sort of kept coming back and back is really that we need commercially available solutions. Um, and then from the North H medical uh, side of things, quite a few of the wish list things that we talked about actually came out in the last release, such as unlimited triggers and more depth for um, larger ladies. Um, but the one thing that we really want is the device integrated wireless into our coils. Um, you know, to put it out there, this is this is the magic we we want to aim for. Uh, we also talk quite a bit about our experiences of setting up a clinical or even just a research service, um, and there were some really really helpful um, advice from that. And one of the key things that everybody keeps coming back about is you really have to involve all of your stakeholders. So you need to make sure that everybody who should be involved is involved from the outset. Um, and especially referrers uh, need to have an interest and spark an interest. And we've also talked very honestly about the large upfront costs that Quelfin is involved in setting up this service. Um, and then once you're moving from research into clinical service, you really need to think about that you produce sufficient expertise among uh, your team, that you have sufficient people trained, that you can cover leave um, and you can also um, cover your reporting. So we talked again about a lot of centres uh, reporting both cardiac and body all together. Um, then other things that are really important is to build on the referrer's confidence um, and make sure that there are some very clear pathways available. Uh, we then talked about more practical things like that coordinating the booking between sometimes completely different departments like the fetal um, and the MRI service about image storage that's also not always straightforward um, and it's really about then gaining that sort of critical mass that you've got sufficient throughput um, to make a case for a clinical service um, and then also obviously consider local clinical governance. Um, the top tips really were is to find your local strength and build them whatever they may be. Uh, definitely partner with a physicist and a radiologist, ideally even um, biomedical imaging, reconstruction, post-processing path available from the university side of things. Um, and as could be an always a service with a smile um, and say, yes, of course, we will do whatever um, would be particularly useful for you because then you do build those collaborations. Uh, we also spent a bit of time talking about 40 flow and MRI, and we definitely had some really good top tips there um, that motion is a big problem um, and we'll hear more about it, what we can do about it, um, but that, that can lead to overestimation of flow, that really one really small, fast acquisition, which quite often we can't achieve because there's a whole mum around the fetus. Um, but we've also talked about that we really should be standardising flow by reporting it at mils per minute, minute per kilo uh, rather than absolute mils. Um, and we've talked a bit about that as long as it's in itself consistent, does it really matter if there is a systematic bias and underestimation? Um, and we'll also talk about how the different clinical components will actually really affect flow. So that is a much more complicated uh, thing to understand postnatally. Um, we all presented our exam cards, kind of talked about what our per perfect exam card looks like, uh, and that was the state to play there. So some black bloods and white bloods, some flows, the 2D or 4Ds, thin stack volumes, um, and then some sort of 3D and the haste for lungs. So fairly similar to what we would expect normally. Um, we've talked a bit about all the things where what fetal cardiac MRI can add, um, most of which is kind of looking at extra cardiac vessels, extra cardiac abdominal um, and lung findings. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about the flow and whether or not it is possible to measure oxygen consumption reliably. Uh, so just to sum up, the quick whistle tool is really, uh, we then have this kind of, after we talked about all the challenges, often fetal cardiac 
I, we did all wonder, is it really worth it? And we all felt the answer is yes. Um, and personally, I feel that um, once you find the perfect sound type to calm a dancing feet, and is note that I really struggled to find a picture of a of fetus because actually even in real time most of our fetus look like that um, and it's important to think about as you've conquered um, fetal cardiac MRI you get the fetus still and the more uh, you really have unboxed the power of postnatal CMR and brought that into fetal life and it then gives you the opportunity to add a little more certainty uh, to one of the most important questions that came up all over and over again in this workshop and that is the question late gestation fetal cardiology uh, what will my baby be in trouble with in the delivery room at what point do i need to press that great big red button and say actually hang on we need extra help we might even need a c-section for this delivery because we are that worried thank you Thanks so much, Thanks Malenka. So much, Malenka. Um, is, there um, is there any question? Any question? We have an echo. Have an echo. If not, Malenka, maybe, maybe you can already say whether there will be another fetal workshop coming up this year. Maybe you can say something about that. So because it was a great, 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 great meeting, meeting should be... Should be yeah, absolutely. So um, so we've decided to do it every other year to give us a bit of time to do some further development. Um, so it's currently planned for June uh, 2025, but we're very aware that that coincides with the SEMR um, mid meeting. So actually at SEMR next week at the fetal SIG meeting, we'll discuss uh, whether we should maybe move it uh, a bit later in the year. Um, so anybody who is attending SEMR, do come along um, to the fetal SIG meeting um, on I think it's 11 o'clock on this other day, um, and we'll discuss uh, best date for the next event. All right, All right. thanks so much. And then we will just quickly hand over. Thank you, Malenka, for this insight into the workshop, which was a great event. Um, so then we will now directly hand over to Alexander Barker from University of Colorado. Great, Alex, that you are with us here today as well. Thank you. And Alex will report about initial reference values and will show us the new insights. Great. I hope everybody can hear me. Give me a thumbs yes, up. Yes, we can, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Great. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to prevent, present some of our early work on establishing reference values for fetal cardiac volumes, function, and I will tease some of our early flow results as well. Um, I'd like to point out that a lot of these slides are part of um, a recent paper that we were able to put out, uh, spearheaded by Prashant Manosha, um, as well as our entire cardiac, fetal cardiac team. Um, this is obviously, as Malenka hinted at, um, really important to involve all stake stakeholders from recruitment to technologists to our referring providers. Um, it really is a team effort. So I just want to recognize them here uh, on the co-authorship panel. Uh, this data that I'll be reporting is really single center, so it's important to have multi-center studies. Uh, looking at prospective recruitment for fetal CMR in third trimester women with healthy developing fetuses, we recruited about 25. Um, with a very narrow gestational age of um, 34 weeks plus or minus one, one week standard deviation. Um, this was really to focus on the late gestational reference values that we know we can get with the Doppler ultrasound device. Um, for those of you who know our work, we give the mom the choice um, as per preference to lay down supine or left lateral tilt. Um, and we typically place the probe and then do localizers to make sure that we have the pro-positioned or repositioned if we're not well um, positioned or have an intermittent signal, and then obtain fetal weight from those mother of child localizers to normalize and index our cardiac values that are obtained from standard CINE BSSFP imaging. Um, I think it takes a little bit of technologist training, obviously, to get all our two chamber, four chamber and short axis um, slices. And there are various tips and tricks, which I'll be happy to talk about in maybe a breakout session or, or discussion afterwards. Um, this is just showing example data. Obviously, it's good example data that fetus does move sometimes and we don't get our short axis stack. But in uh, this case of 25 
uh, volunteers, we got it in about 20 patients. Um, you could see that we over prescribe our slices um, and then you know we show our contours here that are performed just standard um, with circle uh, post processing and uh, just like we do in our kids and adults. One thing that we did that was non standard because we need to compare it to our echo colleagues is that we perform some echo measurements, which are primarily just length measurements focusing on ventricular dimensions and valvular annuli, uh, valve annuli dimensions. Um, we also performed inter observer by Bland Altman and interclass correlation coefficient. Um, our results were quite encouraging when we compare it to the tranche and, and large volume of um, echo papers that are out there referring to normal values. Um, we chose to use Z scores at 34 weeks to compare our values to echo. And um, indeed, um, when we did normalize our values and compute, um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Z scores, uh, you know, it's just really the standard deviation away, the number of standard deviations away from the mean. And we were about plus or minus a half on average away from our echo colleagues. So that was encouraging. I mean, it was also encouraging to find that when we computed volumes, um, our percentage contribution from the left and right ventricle to the combined cardiac output um, aligned very well with prior reports, including our, uh, you know, some of the groundbreaking work back in 1970s and sheep by Rudolf and Heyman, um, as well as PERSA back in 2014 using metric optimized gating and 2D phase contrast MRI. Um, you can see the distribution of combined cardiac output um, contributed by the aorta and the pulmonary arteries and right um, by these um, reports and our values align very well. So 43% of the left ventricular cardiac output contributed to the combined cardiac output, whereby first sub reported with phase contrast imaging, 40% of the combined cardiac output going to the aorta. So we're very encouraged by this. Um, I will point out these are two different techniques. One is volumes and one is uh, phase contrast. So it was encouraging to see two different kind of methods uh, correlating. Um, I originally titled this surprising results. Um, that is our volumes when compared to echo were 50 to 75 percent larger than our echo colleagues um, and their reports on volumes. Um, but the cardiologist pulled me back a bit and said, hey, this is not so surprising. And it has a lot to do with probably the echo assumptions about geometry, um, especially when we're looking at summation of discs and the biplane assumptions um, where, you know, for example, this image shows kind of foreshortening from the apex that occurs when you're off just a bit. Um, and so we did find, of course, echo volumes were much lower. I was, there's also a number of other um, errors that can occur that I won't go into. Um, I, I certainly wanted to be conservative in, in stating this, but I was nervous when I put this out saying that our echo volumes were so much higher. I mean, some of them are as much as 100% more than echo reports. Um, so I kind of put this in, more fetal CMR multi-center studies are needed to confirm, but um, I certainly was encouraged at the same time that our, our paper came out, a JCMR paper came out looking at CMR in newborns, a gestational age of average 40 weeks, um, who are 32 hours old. And I highlight that our volumes are only one to three milliliters less than those 40 weekers. So here you see the 40-weeker the LV EDV compared to ours. Um, we're about three mils smaller. But I think really, and this, this emphasizes Malenka's comment that indexing by weight is probably the way to go because um, if we were to take a look at our indexed volumes between these two studies at 40 weeks gestational age and 35 weeks, they agree quite well, um, better than I would have thought. So this gave me confidence in our results. Um, again, you see that with our RV volumes where indexing really provides excellent agreement between uh, the newborns and our, our um, 35 week uh, old fetuses. Um, so I, I have this slide here. This is kind of just our method of, of segmenting the, the 3D volume of the, the fetus to get a weight uh, calculation um, using kind of a mother of child localizers or 2D localizers. Um, I emphasize, if you look at 34 weeks, there's this large range of fetal sizes. I think this is no surprise, but I think that's why weight is working so well. We are now moving into doing a, a breath health 3D FFE um, in eight seconds. And then we have a, a neural network that our postdoc Takashi Fujiwara has developed in which we can in five minutes or so get a fetal weight calculation. Right now it's very, very time consuming. So this goes back to Malenka's wish list, you know, AI based 
um, computation of some of our, our parameters. Um, I'm running out of time. I just want to emphasize that inter-observer reliability was quite good for volumes, um, and lengths were pretty bad. Uh, you know, greater than 0.5 for ICC is usually considered acceptable. Um, you can see our volumes all fall within that range, except for maybe some of our um, systolic volumes where we know that if someone sneezes while they're doing a systolic volume, maybe uh, there'll be a little bit of a disagreement. And so I will mention there was no um, consensus read and no training beforehand between the two observers, so we could possibly be better. Uh, finally, I just wanted to tease why we're doing this. Well, um, we're looking now at some of our CDH results, and um, we're finding that um, left ventricular global longitudinal strain is, is perhaps maybe being quite good as a prognostic indicator of outcome um, in a very small cohort. Um, I'm just showing Krista Young will be presenting the most recent results at the SCMR in London, but it was uh, area under curve of one for composite outcome of interuterine demise, uh, need for ECMO or postnatal demise. We will be publishing uh, some of our future 40 flow work. I highlight kind of Aaron and Takashi's effort here. Um, I look forward to presenting that maybe in another user meter. Uh, with that, I'm out of time. Thank you for letting me present this and, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone else's results. Amazing. Thanks so much, Alex. There are some questions, so we directly dive into it. Um, from Jack Kites Scott, what is the average gestational age at which these are performed? And then the second one, so what is the assumption regarding which is more accurate for volume, echo or MRI? Great question. Um, I, I want to be conservative. I'm going to answer the second question first. Um, we don't know yet. We got to do the, do the multi-center studies. Um, we really don't have enough data. I, I have to be cautiously optimistic. Um, I think people have accepted that at least our pediatric and, and adult short axis volume calculations are the gold standard. Um, there is fetal motion. We have to accept that um, and understand that will introduce some error. But I am encouraged by our early results in concordance with uh, the newborn study. Um, I think we all have to really answer that question in the future. Um, I think that was the two questions. One was, what do we believe in and what is the average week. gestational age? I mean, it's it's third trimester, oh, greater than 30 weeks. But we're, we're tightly recruiting 34 for our healthy volunteers just to get a really good measurement. All right. Then there's a comment from Eleanor, Eleanor, and you can read it maybe also in your chat. Um, we are working on putting the Colorado volumetric data into parameter Z for easy calculation of that scores. This site has that scores from several sources for postnatal MRI. Do you want to? That's great. Com <laughs> I think that's a good comment. I'm, really, yeah, I'm excited. That's that's really encouraging. I'm glad people, you know, obviously I'm excited to publish these and get these out in the wild. I look forward to hearing about other people's experience. And of course, we're happy to share our data with anyone um, great. who would like Perfect. it. Yeah, that's good, Alex. And then there was um, a hand from Park Sungu. Um, I missed it. I'm sorry for that. Um, after Malenka's talk, maybe you want to raise your question now. Then I could give you the availability to speak. Park, do you still want to talk? Then just give me a, a yes in the chat, please. Just my mistake. All right. Okay. Then we will hand over to our third speaker, Thomas Vollbrecht um, from, oh, sorry, from University Hospital of Bonn. And Thomas is here today, uh, which is great. And he's going to present a clinical case for us. Thank you, Thomas. All right. Please Hi, change. everyone. I, I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Um, I think I'm still sharing. Now you should try it again. <clears throat> hey, do you see it? No. No. Okay. We could also continue with PIM if PIM is ready, and then Thomas, you can um, try. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. What do you think? Should we switch? Yeah, we can switch. Is is that okay for you as well, Pim? Then I will then welcome, I will welcome Pim, Pim now from Amsterdam, Amsterdam UMC. UMC. Um, and um, Pim is going to talk about motion correction strategies for 3D and 4D. Thank you very much, Pim. Great that you're here. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. Perfect. No, it was my. It was actually me. Uh, All right. We'll do a little bit of talking about 3D black blood and uh, Ford and Flow MRI. Um, about three years ago, I started using blood blood imaging. This is without the Doppler ultrasound uh, device. We used um, the sequence from London, as uh, presented by David in The Lancet in 2019. I'm sure he will give us an update later about this technique. So um, what's important here is that we use uh, six stacks at a 3T. So we do two axial, two coronal, and two sagittal uh, acquisitions. And the scan time per stack at 1.5T is about 100 seconds, but at 3T, it's really long, 300 seconds. So that's a bit problematic. Um, we are doing this now. Uh, I'm showing here some 1.5T data from Maastricht, and uh, I am pretty excited about this quality at 1.5T, but I'm showing this Maastricht example because we want to do a motor center study in the Netherlands, in all academic centers in the Netherlands, it's called FUTURE, and we will use a diverse set of uh, vendors and of um, field strengths. So this is going to be a challenge to get this um, dialed in for all uh, three vendors and also for 1.5T and 3T. But we have done 3T at Philips uh, and we have used um, the CRMRG app to perform um, the slice to volume reconstruction with um, the London technology. Uh, and that gives you uh, the 3D reconstruction. So this um, tool compensates for the motion um, that is found in the fetus in the mother's belly during a scanning. So here's an example of a 3, a 3T data set uh, scanned in uh, Utrecht on a Philips. And I think this looks quite all right. So we have the liver on the right side of the fetus. Uh, we see the heart and we also kind of see the septum as well. And the aorta is fine found on the right side of the trachea. So that means that this is a right arch. So I was excited about this until my uh, until the pediatric cardiologist that I collaborate with said, um, this is not a diagnosis, there is not a problem in the feet. So I was like, okay, uh, thanks. I've been excited about something that wasn't really something. So uh, I do have another example, also 3T from Utrecht. And here you see um, that actually the aortic arch is missing. So this is an interrupted aortic arch that you don't really get from the 3D reconstruction, but it's something you can clearly see when you do a 3D segmentation. So these segmentations, I think, are quite important to make additionally to the uh, 3D reconstruction. Another example is, of course, a coarctation, which was so um, nicely described by uh, David and Malou in their circulation paper. And then one other example I'd like to show, also 3D, is um, the case where the ascending aorta exits from the right ventricle and the ducts from the left ventricle. So this must be a transposition of the great arteries. And this was also what was uh, confirmed by the postnatal echo. So we did 30 patients on 3T. I think we had a success rate of about 75%. Uh, scan times were really too long. Um, so we need to uh, accelerate this, this in some way. But I think black blood is particularly useful for coarctation and transposition of the great arteries. Uh, less so for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, double outlets were really difficult to see and we didn't see any septal defects. Um, but this really needs to be systematically investigated by a pediatric radiologists and cardiologists. And, and definitely not me, because I'm a biochemical medical engineer. I'm not trained into recognizing anatomy. So uh, the good news is, is that this worked really well uh, manually. Uh, that was a bit of a, a difficult thing to do manually because you had to send data back and forth and draw masks and stuff. And now we have AI to do so. And this is what's developed by London, the AI, and this has been incorporated by the North company into a browser-based uh, reconstruction tool. And this works extremely well 
I've been using this to make some of these reconstructions. I didn't find any difference with a manual mask or with uh, the tool, and it is done in about uh, 20 minutes, um, as opposed to when I did the manual stuff, it took about two to three hours. So this is a huge improvement of what was available. I'm sure David will speak more about this, and this is gonna be really beneficial for the Dutch multi-center study. So that is 3D motion correction. I also want to show a little bit of our work that we are doing uh, with 4D flow. This is with the Doppler ultrasound device, um, and we have successfully scanned um, in Utrecht as well a um, patient with a transposition of the great arteries. Uh, Pim, uh, Pim, Pim, a, yeah. second. a second, short interruption. Short interruption. Can, you can you increase your, your volume, volume a little bit? Somehow. So, yeah, I can speak louder, sure. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So um, this was a bit of a lucky shot and um, the feed has actually moved a little bit after we started um, the sequence and some parts of the aorta were outside of the field of view. So that was a bit unlucky, but still we could see that there was an elongated um, aorta, which was indicative of a transposition of the great arteries. And this was also confirmed by the postnatal diagnosis. But it had sense acceleration. Um, there was no uh, compensation for maternal breathing or fetal bulk motion. So we were kind of lucky that the baby laid still. And we are currently working on steps towards more motion robustness. So what we are doing is we made a sequence that prospectively undersamples K space in multiple directions. We call it PROUD. And it's a free running a sequence and every K line will be time stamped for um, the maternal respiration cycle with bellows and uh, the fetal heartbeat with the Doppler ultrasound device. So what you can do then is say, um, I want to reject 60%, uh, 40% uh, of the data uh, in the inspiration cycle of the mother because you have um, this information with the bellows. And then you can uh, subdivide this data into eight uh, bins and reconstruct those separately so that you can appreciate what motion is actually found in your acquisition. So this is a PC MRA, uh, piece face contrast MRA that is made from the 40 flow data for these eight bins separately. And you clearly see that there is some motion of the fetus um, over these eight different bins. So then what you can do is register these images in image domain and use the translations that you got from this uh, registration to correct the original case space um, because a translation in image space corresponds to a phase shift in case space. So you can correct each of these bins uh, with, uh, you can correct this translation in each of these bins to make one big um, case space data set again, correct it for the bulk motion and then do compressed reconstruction um, with um, the cardiac phases sorted using the ultrasound gating uh, device. And now you have a motion corrected 40 flow data set. And you can see that in the motion correction here in the descending aorta, there is sharper delineation of the feed head velocities compared to the non-motion corrected ones. You can clearly appreciate this from the PCM array. There is more signal in the aorta with the correction. The streamlines are better corrected uh, better connected um, in the aorta and um, the conservation of mass is uh, better satisfied when using this motion correction. So we are uh, super excited about these results. We can make this even better by synchronized motion bins um, with the Doppler ultrasound um, gating signal because actually this signal is disturbed when there is motion. So you know when a different motion state occurs in the fetus and you don't have to quasi random choose eight bins um, anymore. Then we wanna make some more steps, maybe do with radial implementation for more motion robustness. And also we wanna focus a little bit on three day CINE because that is what we have been doing in adults. And this is actually our first adult case that we scanned with uh, the Doppler ultrasound gating device. And I have never seen such a stable AKG signal before. So we were super happy with the performance of um, the gating device for our three day CNA sequence and for our adult 40 flow as well. So I'd like to thank uh, the team in Amsterdam. I couldn't have done this without Eric. Um, he does most of our technology, super um, exciting. Um, of course, we went to visit uh, Colorado. Uh, we had a little coffee there. We have a collaboration on the 40 flow work. 
which is really nice. Um, Elena and David have been super helpful with implementing um, the 3D black blood sequences and the post-processing of that, and also the team in the UMC Utrecht. So thank you very much. Great. Great. Kim, Kim, thank you so much, thank you so much. for this presentation. I take a look into the chat. Is there anybody that has a question to this great results? I'm very looking forward to what is coming there this year. Probably a lot. If there is no question right now, we will directly, and you can still send the questions in the chat. Feel free to do so. We will now jump to to Thomas again and try to share. We have some technical issues, however, I'm pretty sure we can manage. Um, so Thomas, welcome again. And now it's your speech. Hopefully it works now. Okay, now he it's it's saying that the, my screen should be shared, but it isn't the case, right? And but that's on our side here. Mm. You you should share it now. No, uh, sharing, he, actually. he needs to share his um, his screen because he wanted to share his Dicom view. Okay, you want to share now, Thomas? Sorry for that. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to 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 share actually okay. right now, but but and it says that it's being shared, but um, you don't see it, right? I tried once again. If it's not working, we will just continue with David. If David is already there to start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, would that be okay? <laughs> All right. So David from King's College London, great that you're also here today. David will give us an insight into new <clears throat> solutions on 3D black blood post-processing. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'll um, share my screen. Just tell me. When you can see. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Oh, cool. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, hopefully this will follow on nicely from Pim's talk as well anyway, actually. So, yeah, I was going to, well, new solutions, 3, 3D black blood processing. And I think Pim showed you a little bit about um, the method that we have here and we've used for quite a long time. And um, also that the, that you guys at North have put this, um, uh, if you like, implementation of that uh, online that people can use. But um, for us, it's been around for quite a while, actually. Um, and it's really the bedrock of everything that we do in a lot of our program. Uh, it's a really key part of that. So hopefully I'll talk you through a little bit of that detail. This is us. So um, we're here on the left, St. Thomas's. This is, we're based in central London. I always like to just say where we are. Um, so people know that these are our hospitals, guys in St. Thomas's, Royal Brompton, and then the Evelyn is the Children's Hospital. And King's is our university partner here. So, so this is kind of it. This is it in a nutshell. The motion corrected slice volume registration, what does it do? And uh, apologies, people heard me probably talk about this before, but, um, and I guess the other apology is that I'm a clinician, not a computer scientist, so um, I will stay in my lane. Uh, but uh, this is essentially it. So this is obviously a fetal brain. You've got overlapping stacks here. So this is a sagittal coronal transverse stack of the fetal brain. And throughout that, as you acquire these stacks, the fetus may be moving, but the, all the data is there. And essentially what these algorithms initially um, developed by Maria Mergasova, now de Prez, uh, subsequently developed on by Bernard Kynes, and now um, Elena is doing a lot of work, um, particularly with AI and automating some of these things, as, as Pim mentioned. It essentially takes the stacks, gets the data in there that you're interested in, like the brain here, for example, and then registers it to one three-dimensional volume. So just to kind of show you in real life <clears throat> what that looks like. So this is a, if you look up here, this is an axial stack through the fetal chest. And anyone who's done MR with black blood, you'd recognize this a lot. This is the this is the womb placentas at the back here. This is the umbilicus of the mother. And we're moving up through the chest here. And there's definitely some motion and you get a lot of artifacts um from from fetal motion as they sort of wriggle around but perhaps in a couple of these images you get something reasonable but certainly in the other views i think you'd be really hard pushed to get anything definitive as you go to sagittal coronal view and this is three millimeter slice thickness 1.25 by 1.25 in plane but 
you, you just get the effect of motion. And this is a feature that doesn't really move very much. I think that's another sort of key thing. It's not a huge amount of motion, but you've really only got one plane. So we have multiple overlapping stacks. We take these in multiple orientations. We include the brain um, and the whole uterus, actually. So we got a lot of coverage. Um, and this is actually 11 stacks that covered the thorax using that method, using that software, and you get something like this. So it's actually reconstructed to a higher isotropic resolution than any of the input data. So it's about 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeters, but it is isotropic. Um, and you can see you've got, you can now navigate this in three dimensions quite confidently, particularly for the fetal vessels. Not so much for the heart. I mean, I'll come to some potential solutions for that in the future um, or later in the talk. But this is, as I said, three dimensional data set from 2D data. I often show segmentations of this kind of data, but I actually thought I'll just show you what it really looks like. This is this is kind of the bread and butter. This is what we look at. This is how we analyze and this is how we answer the clinical questions that are sent to us using this method. So um, again, as Pim referenced, we, we published this in 2019. We did a lot of due diligence on this method when we realized how effective it was for the thorax. Um, and a lot of our patients in the came through our research programs had paired ultrasound. So we looked at intra-observer variability, which was very good for MRI on the right versus ultrasound. It was very comparable in terms of just measuring stuff. Basically, we kind of got to the same numbers. <clears throat> We did find a very slight difference in the mean values from MRI with this method compared to ultrasound, and this might be a little different to, to um, Alex's um, things. We're measuring some different things for a start, but this is non-gated data, so we are probably just blurred out to the vessels, and it's not any particular point in the cardiac cycle, probably average somewhere in the middle. In ultrasound, you tend to measure in systole at the widest point, but again, pretty consistent and certainly ballpark um, within the right kind of area and I think it kind of it goes back I think it was just interesting hearing Alex talk about the same sort of stuff is that if you look at fetal echo fetal echo is a very powerful tool and I would tool and I'd never be really disparaging of it in any way but I think there it does have limitations and I think that it is the gold standard but the gold standard we know has significant limitations in terms of accuracy and re reproducibility so kind of knowing what the ground truth is is is, a, is an open question a lot of the time when we're using these new techniques. And then the final thing, and I think this is almost the most critical thing, and I think this the thing for us that made such a such a big difference, is we then looked at in the patients that we were scanning in the study, when we just used the 2D images, the, all those multiple overlapping 2D images, could we identify various structures versus the 3D reconstruction? And obviously you can see if we break it down in these four major areas of vascular anatomy, the, uh, we were much um, better at visualizing those structures with 3D, but critically, it almost never failed, really. It was very, very effective. It was 95 plus percent effective. Once we got someone in the scanner and we said, can we see these structures? We could pretty much see them in every case. And that's stood the test of time, actually. It, this is a very reliable method provided you've got your acquisition parameters dialed in, provided you've got enough data, you will generally get a reasonable output that you can interrogate. So <clears throat> just some examples of that. So we had, um, this is a very early case. It doesn't look fantastic. I'll just, I'm, I'm going to show you segmentations of the data now. Uh, this was a query, a uh, common arterial trunk overriding aorta, ventricular septal defect. Question about the pulmonary vessels. They just couldn't really see them very well. And this is just really simple. That This is the heart. This is the aorta. Really clearly, you've got origin of the pulmonary arteries here from the descending aorta. And this little detail, which could, was very difficult to see on echo, very limited windows, gave you the diagnosis. This is pulmonary atresia, uh, ventricular septal defect, and these are major collateral arteries. So just thinking about how that 3D data can give you that um, the little clincher for your diagnosis. Pulmonary atresia VSD, another case here. I, I won't go into loads of detail. This is the postnatal CT. This is a segmentation of the black blood reconstruction. Very complex disruption to anatomy here. You've got a right arch, aberrant left subclavian artery, collaterals to the left pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery. And we could see all of that at 32 weeks and make the, if you like, the, the right um, counseling and decisions for this baby. Uh, and then we've done a lot of work. My colleague Millie uh, Van Poppel, who's now back in, uh, in, in Amsterdam, actually, um, it did a lot of work looking at things like vascular abnormalities, like right aortic arch, for example. So just some applications, all vascular because of the limitations of the black blood sequences, but potentially very useful. 
And then finally, coarctation, and I think this has been a huge area of work. Um, Tom Woodgate, who's now with us, uh, a, a research fellow taking this on from Milu. Um, again, we've published some work on that, but uh, really just to highlight that the black blood recons, what you're seeing segmentations of here, are absolutely fundamental to all of that work as well. So <clears throat> Alex had a little, uh, oh no, I think it was at the beginning you were talking about uh, a recent publication about where does MRI fit in the clinical path pathway. It's interesting because I think this is, we, we, we treat that exactly the same way. And I think it's a slight open question. You know, other centers uh, may have different views about that, but for us, it is part of this pathway. It is on the right here. It is our fetal cardiology colleagues will refer to us for fetal MRI in those cases where it is deemed necessary after if you like expert fetal cardiology assessment. We don't regard it as a screening tool, we regard it as a, a second level tool for diagnosis. And based on the um, the work that we've done and with the Lancet publication in particular, we were able to effectively get that provided as a clinical service here in St Thomas's for our patients and uh, that is reimbursed by the National Health Service here. Um, and over that past few years that we've been doing that, we've generated quite a lot of experience with that. So in the last uh, three or four years, and this is the patients to date with outcome data, um, our total experience is now approaching 700 cases, but this is the cases over that cohort where we have outcome data. Uh, we now have 388 uh, referrals um, that we're sort of putting together now, and again, Zia uh, Lim, another colleague, and Tom are putting this together. And for more information, you can see their abstract in SEMR. Um, all of these basically use motion correct, corrected SVR. It is, it is, um, the, if you like, the most um, standard part of all of our assessment. 387 of them were reported, so I think the success rates again continues to be pretty high. Um, we're looking at the the overall accuracy of that. I'm not going to give you figures, but I think it, it it's very good. I think we do see occasional incidental findings, but they are relatively minor. Primary <clears throat> lymphangiectasia, just to sort of broadly talk more widely about the applications of MRI. Something else we can look at with MR. We've seen that in um, we've been able to describe that in about half of the patients that we were at risk. We added that to their care, not to say. Um, that we couldn't Maybe see it. Come to an end. Sorry for oh, an interruption. You could okay, no um, slowly come to an end. Thank you. Um, and and quite a high um, rate of incidental findings as well. So I'll skip through these. I think the final things I really wanted to say was that we also can use this not just for the thorax. This is a, again really critical for us for the brain. Um, we get these beautiful reconstructions. All of these get reported, and for the placenta. Um, and of course, we have the Doppler gating device, and I think a big uh, area that we're looking at again, and we're going to put some of this in SMR, is combining Doppler gated sinew sequences with motion correction. And we've had some uh, really intriguing results from that so far as well. So uh, I will leave it there and um, yeah, welcome uh, any questions. All right. Thanks, David. And there are questions. Um, the first one, I think, refers to the speaker before. So I start with a Bell Alex um, question. What program are you using to visualize the 3D reconstruction? Are you importing back to PAX? Did you get my question, David? Yeah. Oh, sorry, that was me. Sorry, yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, um, we use a variety of different um, software packages if you mean to the recons we we use some open source software but yeah we can easily convert back to DICOM and then you can use anything that's a DICOM reader you get an NPR view that's essentially all you need from the from the recons there are three-dimensional volumes so anything that you can get an NPR view on um, is pretty effective uh, the segmentations we use again a variety of a mixed bag of software there, there isn't really a piece of software out there which is kind of designed for this type of data. Um, black blood, 3D, fetal, it, it, it's not really there yet. So, um, but the, the mainstay of the diagnosis is from the NPR of the 3D volume and is, you can use any software for that really. All right, okay. Another question um, for David. How long is your routine fetal CMR examination for vascular anomalies, including enough 2D stacks for 3D SVR? So we, we've spent a lot of time optimizing the sequences. I think we, within about 15 minutes, we can probably get enough 2D 
data, 15, 20 minutes to reconstruct, probably less. I mean, we, we're actually quite um, liberal, if you like, with how much we acquire. Um, our total scan time is about an hour, but we have lots of other things in that protocol. But just for the 2D black blood, we're talking 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there was one question from Hand Galal Eldin Mohamed, Mohamed, and I'm not pretty sure if it was for Pim or for David, so you can decide who wants to answer. Is it possible to get 3D and 4D flow without ultrasound gating device? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that. I actually had it in the slide um, <clears throat> that I skipped. But so we have done some image based gating work. I'm sorry, Pim can also say something, but we've done in the past some image based gating work, um, which it seems to be effective. I think the the Doppler, our initial impression is that it may give us a slightly higher temporal resolution than we can get from imaging and I, from the image based gating. And I think that when we're looking at those metrics of function and flow, I think that's really critical when you have a fast fetal heart rate that you have the temporal resolution. So that's something that we're comparing with, but it, it is feasible. Um, the other side of that is the processing time required for an image-based gating versus the Doppler device, which basically gives you gated data off the scanner. And I think that is um, a, a real <laughs> a, a real advantage. Um, it's a real life advantage as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. And the field strength you are using, David? We was a question from Aaron England. We're mainly at 1.5. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we will make a last try and turn, hand over to Thomas. Um, Thomas, could you please try and share your screen again? Yes, and now it works. Perfect. So I, so I directly, directly hand over to you. Very, very, you very, are very, you are very. We cannot we hear cannot you, Thomas. Hear you, Thomas. Maybe, Thomas. You Maybe you can increase, increase the volume. The volume. So you hear me better? Very, 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 very silent. Silent. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, can I try it this way, or what do you think? Uh, it's uh, almost, almost impossible. impossible. But, but Somehow louder. Somehow louder possible. And now, do you hear me better? No, not really. I... Try it again, Thomas. You hear me? Try it again. Hello. Hello. Okay, so do you hear me? That's me. It's it's okay. It's okay. We try okay. it like that. Okay, I tried. Um, okay. Um, so sorry for the trouble. I I hope you you see uh, my screen and hear me. Um, okay. Over the next few minutes, um, I'll be presenting a recent case from our side. Um, in which the additional MRI um, scan played a crucial role in influencing um, clinical decision making, specifically in uh, determining the optimal time for delivery. So um, the obstetricians at our local prenatal, prenatal medicine department referred a pregnant women in the third trimester of pregnancy um, for an additional MRI examination. The woman um, had been previously um, hospitalized um, due to unclear fetal arrhythmia. Um, and uh, also the fetal echo scan was deemed insufficient um, in the end um, due to advanced gestational age and obesity of the woman. Um, some findings could be raised. <coughs> um, first, there appeared to be restricted atrial communication across the foramen, and second, the right ventricle um, appeared larger than the left one and apex forming, and lastly, um, a kinking of the arterial duct could be identified, likely causing um, severe stenosis. So the MRI um, was requested specifically 
uh, to address the intracardiac anatomy, including the foramen, and to assess um, the severity of the ductal stenosis. To address these points, we use our standard imaging protocol, including planning sequences and T2-weighted imaging um, for the gross anatomy, followed by standard um, 2D axial scene imaging for um, detailed uh, for detailed examination of the intracardiac anatomy or cardiovascular anatomy, and complemented by 4D flow imaging to evaluate the hemodynamics of the duct. Okay, and now I try to change to our die computer. And I hope you see the images. So we have here the- It worked. Oh, sorry? sorry? Yes, Tomat, it worked well. We can see the DICOM now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here you see the axial scene images. And um, I think you can recognize um, normal shapes of the left and right atrium. Um, so we see no signs of restrictions. Um, across the foramen and uh, the pulmonary veins are narrow and uh, regularly drain into the left atrium. The same applies to the ventricles. Um, they appear normally, um, both the left and the right ventricle can be clearly distinguished by their anatomic features. Um, the apex is being formed by the left ventricle, and we see no signs of any um, cardiac malformations, um, no septal defects um, or other conditions. On the outflow tract level, over here we see the aorta rising from the left ventricle, and the main pulmonary artery coming from the right ventricle, and also the the right and left pulmonary artery are normally developed. But then one thing, one thing that comes up here is this um, yeah, pulsation artifact probably the, that is likely related to the arterial duct. Um, and to, to identify this even better, we, we acquired another axial image stack for, for higher contrast. Um, and here you can see this, this artifact in this vessel even better, indicating some kind of, um, of um, turbulent jet of high velocity. So to, to visualize the, the arterial duct, we acquired some images in another sagittal plane. And here you see this, a typical course of the arterial duct. Um, so instead of um, running um, alongside the aortic arch, which you can see over here, so in this shape, um, the arterial duct, so, um, um, has uh, typically is running um, downwards and then following a bend is moving um, dorsally to the aortic isthmus. So to um, to investigate the the intensity of the blood flow turbulence, we employed a 4D flow scan, and as you can see here, we do see this a typical course, this king shape of the arterial duct, and we do see blood flow turbulences, but we can know, we, we, we can rule out uh, a higher degree of stenosis. Yeah, so I, I will go, go back to my slides. Hope you can see it again. Okay, yeah, so we here's can. a summary of the MRI findings. Um, unlike the echo, we found normal intraatrial communication across the foramen without without signs of restriction, and normal sized ventricles with the apex being formed by the left one. And we could 
confirm um, um, the typical course of the arterial duct, but could rule out uh, severe constriction. So overall, we found normal cardiac anatomy and could exclude um, conditions that would have required uh, any special perinatal therapy. And as a result, um, it, was, it was decided to postpone the caesarean section that had previously been scheduled for the next day by one week. And after birth, the achieval duct closed spontaneously and now the newborn is progressing uh, without any cardiac constraints and demonstrates healthy development. So to conclude, um, I, th I think the first basic conclusion is from this case is that fetal cardiac MRI uh, using the Doppler ultrasound technique is a technique that a technique that is very practical in clinical situations because it's ready to use for standard sequences and um, image planes or um, the, the images in general can be adapted during scanning or repeated if necessary because um, um, the review of quality um, is or, or they can be reviewed for quality even in real time. Um, another conclusion is that an additional MRI may not only provide structural or anatomical information, but can also be used for quantifying, uh, for example, to, to um, estimate the total cardiovascular output in obstructive diseases, or um, as happened in this case in vascular, vascular constrictions. And uh, finally, it can be expected that fetal CMR may also be advantages, uh, advantages in other clinical application outside the CHD spectrum, for example, in congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, as already mentioned by, by Alex. Okay, that's from my side. Um, sorry for the trouble again, and thank you for your attention. No problem, Thomas, and thank you. Uh, great that it worked out because that was an amazing case you shared with us. Um, thanks for that. There was one question, one last question I have to say due to the timing um, for Michael Erdson, and that was a question for probably David. Do you scan before week 30? Okay, no. We only scan fetuses in or, or, or pregnant women in third trimester, and the the early scan we had was in week thirty one. Yeah. All right. So Thanks, no Thomas. Yeah, great. Um, Alex, uh, David, was that the case also for your cases, or did you scan earlier than thirtieth week? Most, almost all of them are above thirty weeks, but mm -hmm. some of the innovations within that, particularly have, uh, that Elena has um, developed, are much more tolerant to fetal motion during the scan and and changes of position within the womb during the scan. Um, so uh, we have yet to kind of really test it, but I think it, in theory, it is potentially much more motion motion robust at earlier gestational ages. All right. Thank you. So it's time already. Um, <coughs> no one to share. Do you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to share this post with Sinsa. Ah, sorry. About um, I'm sorry. I, have, I hand over to, to Fabian <laughs> no for a second. So we have one more thing to, to, to share, and you should see my screen now, everyone. Yes. Um, because we have talked a bit um, about the um, post-processing today um, and um, yeah I know but my screen doesn't want somehow today is a weird day <laughs> of sharing so okay some technical problems here as well share why well, doesn't want to share it does right <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't make it large. We can see. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I know, but I have uh, I have a <laughs> my uh, computer doesn't want to make the next slides. But you can see what I want to share. Um, what we have done 
is um, basically um, the we call it the London approach um, of um, the things that are available on uh, on GitHub and that everything um, which Pim and um, David were reporting on. Um, we have um, seen this and one output of the Hazelwood um, workshop was that we someone needs to make it easier. So we took this um, challenge and said, OK, the implementation of the current pipeline is challenging. Um, so what we have done is um, we implemented basically um, the the Docker where you need to understand Linux commands, where you need to have a high performance PC, you need to run the Docker. And um, these are steps which are quite, um, let's say, cumbersome. And um, we have done it this way that you basically zip your DICOM images, um, you start the reconstruction, and then you get a notification um, when all the uh, stuff is ready. Um, so you don't need to wait, you just wait for an email and then um, you get your data. And basically it works like this. This is an online version. You, um, um, you get access from us. Um, you can use it for brain and, and for heart and like for cardiac stuff. Um, you just upload the data. Um, you decide slice thickness and resolution. Um, you get your email not notification, so don't forget to put your email in there, otherwise you don't get a notification. Um, of course, this software is not yet FDA or uh, CE marked, so we have a little warning saying that this is on your research um, and uh, this is for research purposes only. Um, then you upload your data. Um, you will um, then see this screen that this reconstruction is, is, is ongoing. And after a while, maybe after 10 to 20 minutes, you will get an email saying your reconstruction is completed. Then you can preview the results or download it. And we um, have also a viewer on it. So you can view your data and um, then download it. And based on this, on the um, reconstructed data, you can then make your uh, segmentations. This is an example from Malenka Bissell from Leeds. Um, she um, uh, shared with us and um, one very fun thing is as well because she really likes 3D printed. <laughs> <laughs> this is an example of the same data set 3D printed. Um, I think this is really nice and um, we're now thinking, okay, um, what we do with this tool, we um, want to make this available for everyone um, to start with this kind of imaging. Um, and see what uh, we can get out of there. So um, you're invited to contact us um, to uh, to get access to this tool and uh, learn together how we can uh, improve the clinical outcome of this imaging. Yeah, that's what I wanted to share. <clears throat> Great, thanks Fabian for this addition. All right, we are quite over time today, um, but I think it was interesting to talk about everything anyway. Um, thank you all for your participation. Um, thank you to all our experts that presented a lot of very interesting uh, information today. And we are very happy to see you again on um, March 20th. Um, that is the next webinar session. And whenever you have any topics of interest if you want to contribute actively then please contact us um, or myself or fabian and we are very happy to to cooperate with you thanks so much for all the experts for your um, um results sharing with uh, it with the community um it was really nice to see um that this field is um, moving and we get more and more results so this is very exciting um yeah thanks for sharing this uh, with us all right so we will also share um, the recording with you. And with that, we will close the session now. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.